She was 11. She was 11 years old when she got drugged and brought to Mumbai. <laughs> she was 11 when she was abandoned and sold. She was 11 and she was forced to do things with men she didn't want to do. She was 11 when she got put into a small dark room with a tiny window. This is where they broke her, physically and mentally. She was 11, 11 and alone and stuck in the darkness and didn't know how to get out. She was 11. She is now 40 and she finally got out. She finally got out, but that meant she was stuck in that industry for nearly three decades. An industry she did not choose. A life she did not choose. She was forced at the age of 11. Another girl was nine. She was nine when her mother died. She was nine when her dad left her. She was nine and she didn't know what was going on. She was nine when the brothel owner told her that her dad had sold her. She was nine and she had to do things with men she didn't want to do. She was nine, nine and alone and stuck in the darkness and didn't know how to get out. She was nine. She is now 32 and she is still stuck. She doesn't know what else to do. The only thing she knows is that industry, the sex work industry. She had no education, she had no choice. She is still stuck in the life her father gave her. A life she did not choose. I am Noor and I'm 18 years old. I've met these women and because of their stories, I can no longer sit on the sidelines. What did you think when you heard these stories? What did you feel? Felt shocked? Hopeless, wanting to do something, but thinking the problem is too big. Me too. I thought, what could I do as an individual? I won't change anything. Have you felt this before? When scrolling through daily updates and news, seeing images and reading about the horrors from around the world? Then the next minute, we find ourselves endlessly scrolling and forgetting about what we just read. This is sitting in the passive accepting what happens to people and not doing anything about it. We all do it. Life in the Margins, a literacy class last year taught by Ibu Harriet, introduced me to the concept of marginalized communities. We looked at a range of lived experiences from ethnographies to relevant news articles to documentaries. I was asked to choose a community to focus on as a research, as a research project. The documentary, Born in a Brothel, led me to consider the community of the red light district in Mumbai. The deeper the research, the more questions I had. How did they get there? What's their backstory? What led them to choosing this industry? Was it a choice? Were they forced? What do they think? What do they feel? Can they leave? The articles, the websites, and the documentaries weren't enough. I traveled to India to find out for myself. I wanted to connect with the women behind the stories and, under and understand their context and this industry. But before zooming in, I zoomed out. Did you know that as a global industry, the sex work sector is valued at billions of dollars annually? Sex work is one of the oldest professions and for some women, maybe a deliberate and lucrative career choice. For many though, it is not. And hidden within that giant number, there are 4.8 million women, girls, some men and boys trafficked. Whilst focusing on India, I thought I should start by having a look in my own backyard. Each country has different legal and cultural perspectives. In my own country, the Netherlands, both prostitution and the operation of brothels are legal. One might assume that women working in the red light district in Amsterdam 
do so by choice. Many believe that because it's legal and openly visible, those involved must willingly participate, right? They all want it, don't they? If it's legal, it's their choice, right? This was my assumption as I cycled through the Valle, the red light district of Amsterdam. Amsterdam and India may appear not to have a lot in common, but the reality for women all over the world is that they are trafficked into a world of exploitation and abuse. While some may have chosen this path, a significant portion find themselves trapped through betrayal and demand. In India, prostitution is viewed as an insult to the sacredness of marriage and the family. This meant if the, family were, if the woman were able to escape the brothel in the red light district and return to the family, the family wouldn't welcome back their daughter. They would look at her as if she was a disgrace. So, this is a scenario where something bad happens to you. Something horrible happens to you and you have no control over it whatsoever. After managing to break free from this harrowing situation, you return home seeking comfort and support from your family. However, instead of finding comfort, you encounter rejection. They look at you as if you are a disgrace, even though it was never your fault. Your own family, the woman that birthed you, looks at you as if you are a disgrace. This is the reality for some of these women. So regardless of why women become prostitutes, shame, violence, lack of viable options, and cycles of debt are some of the reasons they may not be able to leave. At the top floor of a five-floor building in Pune, India, in a little office where the air is filled with the aroma of Indian food drifting from the, nearby, from the nearby kitchen. Next to the kitchen, there's a window covered with sturdy bars. Through these bars, I watch the bustling activities of the red light district streets below. Men entering and exiting the brothels, their gaze wandering, women adorned in their finest colorful makeup, attire and makeup, gracefully stand on the sidewalk, exchanging moments for money. I stood there for 30 minutes, just observing. I wonder to myself, why is this happening to them? Why is this their life? And why is this my life? Why do I get to live on a beautiful island and they are stuck in a brothel? Why do I get a loving family and she gets a dad who sells her? Why do I get an education and they don't? Why? My explorations in India went beyond looking through the window of that five-story building. It went beyond trying to understand the motivations, dynamics, risks, and problems within this industry. I wanted to know if things were changing and who is making the change. There is a woman. Her name is Philomena. Philomena is an empowering woman who's the founder of the NGO, the Lighthouse Harbor Society. Her goal is to break the cycle, the cycle of children doing the same work as their parents and their grandparents. Philomena currently has three safe houses and she's giving 32 children an opportunity in a life outside of the red light district. She gives them the opportunity to have an education, to have good health care, and to live in a different environment for a brighter future. Not only does she help these children, but also women who were sold, forced, manipulated into prostitution at a young age. She gathers these women to her office to have workshops and to be able to socialize. She also provides these women with the knowledge about medicine, hygiene, and information about mental health. <clears throat> Philomena connected us with some of the women. The two stories I shared at the start came from them. Sat in a small room, meeting them, not as I expected. Sat in a circle, talked and shared. The translator changed their Hindi to English so that I could understand, understand the stories of horror, stories of their lives. It was heart-wrenching. Someone once asked me, why this? Why go down the rabbit hole finding more about this uncomfortable, unpleasant, avoidable topic? Hope and connection. That is my answer. 
I have hope for this humanity, hope for empowering women in this industry, and most importantly, I have hope for action. When I met Philomena and learned how she's putting her all into helping these women and children, immediately a connection formed. How could I be part of the change she is creating? Meraki, to do something with soul, creativity, and love. This is the name of my brand. This brand is dedicated to making a positive impact on people's lives. This brand aims to transform darkness into beauty, while also amplifying awareness of individual stories. Our approach is infused with soul, creativity, and love, ensuring that every endeavor we undertake carries meaning and purpose. So how could I use my creativity to transform the horrifying stories into beauty? Beauty based on the strength and resilience Philomena has in her, the empowering things she's doing. It called for something evocative and symbolic. This necklace that I'm wearing today is designed by me and is called Philomena to shine a light on all the hard work she's doing. The centerpiece of this necklace symbolizes resilience in the form of a helix. This helix plate is in a way an armor for our heart. The face pendant, a symbol of our shared humanity, serving as a reminder that we are all connected by our common experiences and emotions. Etched in Hindi on another pendant are the words break the cycle. This encapsulates the essence of Philomena's mission to support, to spread awareness, to create equality and opportunity, and ultimately to break the cycle of horror faced by so many. The star pendant, a symbol of strength. A star shines brightly, guiding the way in the darkness, just as Philomena serves as a beacon of hope for these women and children. The lotus pendant, rich in symbolism, represents spiritual enlightenment, beauty, and purity. Together, these pendants form a portrait of Philomena herself, strong, resilient, compassionate. The profit I made and will make in the future of these necklaces is all going towards Philomena. Along with this creativity, it felt important that the action involved our bodies, empowerment, endurance, community, and accomplishment. The 18th of May, the day I took action. By taking on the challenge of a 10K run, not only did I push my own limits, but I also pushed for change with the 20 other people who joined me on this challenge. Some people did 5K and others ran with me for 10K. The run was truly amazing. The support, the people, the energy, the way we all came together at six in the morning and all ran for Philomena, for the woman and for the children. I have funded around 70 million rupiah of the 88.5 million rupiah we need. This money will be going towards Philomena and hopefully her fourth safe house. I want to say thank you again to those who joined. But this was not the end of an already inspiring, empowering day. In the evening, I gathered 20 women to a beautiful space at Myra Penaloza's shop in Changu. It was an emotional but beautiful night filled with connection and unity. We had a tea ceremony where we had a moment where we could reflect. The space was filled with so much energy, so much feminine energy. It was beautiful. This was also the moment I first showcased my necklace to the world. These connections, moments, events were partly me stepping out of the passive, but I wasn't alone. Heidi, my mentor, an amazing woman who's an inspiration has helped me. <laughs> has helped me with every aspect and she talks to me in a way that makes me realize I can do more than I think. Not only pushing me towards a physical 10K run, but also pushing through the psychological barriers that stop me from going into action. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Along with that, I also want to say a huge thank you to my parents. I couldn't have done it without you guys. 
And I also want to say thank you to Ibu Heria, Maru, Myra, Nikki, Ibu Kate, Peg George, Ayu, and of course Philomena, and anyone else who has helped me during this journey. Me running or creating or talking might not directly change a girl's life somewhere in India, but I know Philomena is creating change. And if I can contribute, collaborate, then can't we all? Rather than saying that's a part of life, we can't change everything. Start asking questions. Know about it. Read about it. Talk about it. That's already more than just not dealing with it. And if you're lucky like me and have a mom who wants to travel to India with you, you can figure out and learn even more and connect with people and collaborate. And maybe it isn't about having a solution, but it's about us knowing the problem, finding a way you can contribute. Perhaps it's your bank balance, perhaps it's your creativity, perhaps it's the way you ask questions. You can shake the world in gentle ways. And I know, and I'm aware, that this is a small drop in the ocean of women's rights. It's a small drop, but at least it's a drop, because my ocean is for me standing up for women. And as we all sit here today, a woman sits in a brothel in India. Thank you. Yeah.